Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's event. For anybody who is joining us for the first time this morning, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm going to be your host this morning. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps, and you're all very welcome where you're joining us for the first time, or indeed, we have a lot of our regular attendees registered, I saw from the list. I'm just going to quickly run through these uh, intro slides, and then we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsor, DMX Asset Management. Uh, if you're looking for a small cap, micro cap uh, fund manager, please do check out their website for the relevant fund information, fact sheets, PDS and financial services guide. Quick compliance and disclaimer slide. Uh, if you are joining us here for the first time, companies we have on here, Generally, are capped under 300 million in market cap, are in revenue and approaching cash flow break even, or indeed are already profitable. Uh, generally, from outside the resources and biotech sectors, uh, what I class as industrial micro caps, which kind of covers uh, off all the rest of the sectors, whether that's micro cap healthcare, financial services, uh, consumer staples, based, uh, micro cap technology, kind of anything outside of resources and biotech generally. A structured this morning's webinar, as always, uh, each presenter's got a 30 minute slot, which we roughly break down into a 20 minute prezzo and 10 minutes of q and If you do have any questions for any of our presenters, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function. It just makes it easier for me to moderate the questions. Uh, please note the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel on Monday morning. Uh, you can follow us pretty much on all the socials. Twitter is probably the best place. Uh, YouTube, as I said, for the recording of this webinar. And indeed, we've got about 70 odd webinars uh, with over 100 ASX microcap companies up on the YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to subscribe there, LinkedIn. And I also write a free uh, microcap newsletter, which you can get on the Substack platform. Just search for Coffee Microcaps. Um, our first presenter this morning is Judith Mitchell. She's the CEO of Next Science Limited. Uh, after that, we have returning to present to us uh, John Kelly and Will Souter from Atomo Diagnostics. And then finally, we are got another returning presenter, Jay Albany from Wide Open Agriculture. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Judith, if you would kindly share your screen. Right. Uh, I can see the cover slide of your presentation now, Judith. Um, thank you. And thank you, everybody. We appreciate the invitation. Uh, next science, and I have um, slightly longer disclaimers than Will. <laughs> next science is a company that has an answer for something called the biofilm. And that makes us a little unusual in the world. There is currently nobody providing truly a non-toxic answer to biofilm. And biofilms are in our external environment, but unfortunately for humans, biofilms are also the cause of about 80% of chronic infections in humans. So the company started in 212 with a scientist um, that came out of the biomaterials group at Medtronic. And he had found a way to take down biofilms, particularly in the area, our first area of treatment, which is chronic wounds. So probably all of you know somebody or has had somebody in their family or in the extended friend group that had a wound that just didn't heal. So a diabetic foot ulcer or a bed sore or a venous leg ulcer. And the reason those wounds don't heal is actually because of biofilm. So a biofilm is like a bomb shelter for bacteria. And antibiotics actually can't get through a biofilm. So you have to find a way to take it down. And we're lucky enough at Next Science that we have a patented platform that allows us actually to eliminate the biofilm and get to those bacteria and provide an environment where the bacteria don't survive either. So as I mentioned, our first platform was actually treating chronic wounds, which is a huge market in the United States. And 
you know, several companies within the Australian ASX environment take part in that marketplace, including Aroa and Polynova and a little bit of Avita as well. And these patients are really quite ill because the part that most people miss, whilst it looks like a chronic wound and it's silent and they don't complain and nobody's saying very much, this actually is a cause of death in about 27% of patients over a two-year period. The actual patient group costs the US healthcare system $50 billion. Within Australia, we on average have about 400,000 sufferers from year to year, and it costs the Australian government about $2 billion. Um, so it is a section of the population that needed an answer. Additional to that, we've developed a set of portfolio that allows us to actually prevent things like surgical site infections. So if you have an operation, say you have a hip or a knee replacement, you're putting metal into humans and that makes that area susceptible to a biofilm and therefore susceptible to an infection. So in bringing technologies to the marketplace that allow you to prevent that type of incident, not only can you save lives, you can help health systems save money. And we believe we can build a strong viable company delivering these technologies to the various advanced healthcare markets or around the world. So right now we have some lead products and the first one is experience and it is in the surgical site infection space. We currently up until June of this year, had all of our business within the US. The product is about a year from release in the United States market. And this product is growing in adoption, growing in evidence and growing in popularity. In June, we started to ship into a distributorship in New Zealand. In July, we started to ship to a distributorship in Australia. The major advantage of this product is that it isn't disruptive to the surgical technique that goes along today. It replaces one of the saline rinses as at least the last rinse, although you can use it all the way through the procedure. And we are a few, probably three or four weeks out from producing our first two retrospective studies of the product, which show a total of about 1,200 cases with zero infection. Now, whilst every surgeon any of you are ever going to meet is going to tell you they don't get an infection, that's really not quite how the data pans out. So minimally, um, the infection rate is normally around 2% in hip or knee replacement as an average. And over time, that builds. So whilst in the first 90 days, it's quite low, if you actually look at the 15-year data, it's closer to 6%. So we're helping with that fact originally starting in the short-term period, but providing an environment where the biofilm did not lay down at the time of surgery. Once you close this patient, you've then got a sterile environment. So we believe we have every chance for giving people an infection-free free future. And our other business is in the wound care market. So as a company that is able to effectively take down a biofilm, we can actually promote healing really quite quickly. And where most people would average a, a treatment paradigm that runs for 12 to 16 weeks, we generally see all wounds that we treat, regardless of how old they were when we started, close before the 12 week period. We had a really nice second quarter and we are continuing to grow and build and we fit straight into um, Mark's character because we're months away from trading in the black. So our Q2 highlights, our product sales grew 99% on the same time in prior year and 70% on the first quarter of 2022. We have a partnership now with Zimmer Biomet. Zimmer Biomet are a global partner for us in a product called Back to Shore, which is a rinse to go in infected joints. They're also a US partner for a distributor for experience, which is our prophylactic product. And we sent them our first shipment in June. 
experience, as I mentioned, lots in New Zealand. We also appointed the Australian distributor. At the same time, we appointed the Australian distributor for our wound care job, Blastex. And that distributor is a company called Oroderm, who represent both Douglas Farmer in New Zealand and Aratex in Australia. So not only calling in hospitals, calling on dermatologists, but you will see the products stocked in quite a few of the pharmacy groups around the Australian market. We expanded our New Zealand surgical distributorship to a product that also is used in surgery to close the wound as the surgeon is stitching up. As you look at our portfolio, in increasing our sales, we did manage to pull in some additional products. So Back to Shore is a product we've had since um, we started trading. So about 2017, uh, we started sales and Back to Shore went on sale through Zimmer Biomed in the United States. It's now available around the world. Experience was launched in April of last year through a direct sales force of our own. And then we brought a company called Telebio into our distributorship to help us with plastic surgeons, which is a specialty area for them. Telebio is also an Aroa partner, if people wonder where they've heard the name before. And then, as I mentioned, in the orthopedic sector, we're also sharing market space now with Zimmer Biomet. Zimmer Biomet have about 30% share of the US hip and knee market. So this gives us the opportunity to leverage their coverage. Then Blastex, our wound care product that has been back in our hands since 2021. We did spend two years with 3M, but that partnership um, wasn't giving us what we wanted. So we actually had to ask them, could we separate? Then Tridonex is a wash going to a company called Triad Life Sciences. It's particularly designed to prepare the bed for tissue preparations or amniotic tissues. Triad Life Sciences was recently purchased by Convitec. Convitec are one of the largest companies in wound care in the world. Their lead product is a bandage called Aquacel AG and dominates the antimicrobial bandage market. So this is turning into a very interesting partnership for us. And then Surgex, as I mentioned, is our antimicrobial gel in a sterile form that goes on the closure of the surgery. Although we've started to grow our business outside the US, the majority of all of our Q2 sales were, excuse me, actually in the US market. So as we move through, um, we have been reporting since our launch, the levers for growth on our experience product. And those levers are obviously surgeons and surgeons need to work in hospitals. So we've been tracking those two numbers um, through and we're getting reasonable growth. What we're working on now is getting more penetration with the surgeons across all of their surgery lists. So, as I said, every surgeon is going to tell you they don't really suffer from infections. That's very true in the main. But somehow those data still collects and those patients still end up in revisions. And so the more people we can convince to prophylactically use the product on all patients, the better off all the patients are going to be. So we're still working on taking people from just saying, putting this on their high risk patients. So patients who've come from cancer treatment or maybe have had diabetes or very overweight, they're all susceptible, highly susceptible to infection. So I know that the surgeons we've talked to are, are using the product on them in preference, but those surgeons that have taken the leap of faith and are using it on all of their patients because they're quite happy to argue with their CFOs that it's worth the investment, they are reaping the rewards of very, very low to zero infection rates. We're now in the middle of the rollout of experience to the Zimmer sales force. So Zimmer going to market with about 2,600 reps across the United States. We've trained the first 10 groups um, and we've got 25 to go. That will all be completed in the next two months, culminating in a pres some presentations from our surgeons at the Zimmer National Meeting, which is the last weekend in August. As I mentioned, we commenced sales in New Zealand 
Um, people who follow us closely would know that we irritate our competitors a lot. And we had one trying to um, really just tip over our boat by, you know, challenging us in civil court around our claims and our tests. We've resolved that dispute and it's now been dismissed in the court. We are, as we mentioned at our AGM, underway um, in a hunt for a new CEO. At our AGM in May, I announced that I will be retiring next year. And we wanted to make sure that a few things were available to the company. One is that the CEO is actually based in the United States. It's too big an opportunity. It is where the money is. It is the place that is really very complex. And it is where the CEO belongs. So we are recruiting a US-based CEO and we hope to have that. We've been in the process now for a couple of months and I would hope that we see that finished before and appointed before we start Q4. We've continued to expand our direct sales team. So these are salespeople from Next Science selling our products directly into the market. And we also continue to see expansion on the publications in the, in the surgical irrigation space. And why is this important? It's share of voice. It's the same reason why you do plenty of research to get plenty of publications so more and more people hear about what you're able to do. Right now, this is our cash waterfall for the first half and we have $11.1 million in the bank. Our operating use was three and a half million in the quarter. So what are we gonna do now for the rest of the year? We've launched Trident and we've got an experience to Zimmer. And I just included in here the brand labels off the packaging. And the reason I've done that is to show you that we have, with the cooperation of our business partners, kept the next science brand names for these products. And we think that's important because if the business partners decide they don't want to do this anymore, they've spent their time and energy building our brand. And that's in everybody's best interests. So as we move into, we're now what, almost 30 days into the second half, uh, we're shipping Surgex tomorrow and Experience tomorrow. So Surgex to New Zealand and Experience to Australia. And then the Origin Group will be launching Blastex in Australia in September. We have a very positive outlook for the second half. We obviously have a lot of new distribution partnerships. We have more product launches. We've expanded our territories. And we continue also to support research into our product, both from a randomized control group, from investor, no, investigator related studies, as well as um, some retrospective work for people looking back on what their experience has been with our products. All in all, um, that is going forward, our major investment in the next year and a half is actually in our clinical research. So, questions? Uh, thanks, Judith. Um, I, let, me, let me kick off the, the questions. Um, in terms of the distribution agreements, can we just maybe drill down on the commercials of those there um, in terms of, you know, do the distributors just pay you a straight royalty or licensing fee? Is it, you know, a, a split of revenue, a split of profit? Yeah, how do these uh, distribution deals where they're in place generally uh, work out uh, for next science? Okay, so we run our distribution agreements like um, we're the wholesaler and they're the retailer. So we ship them product at an agreed cost. Um, most of the, no, all of those contracts have minimum requirements in them for them to be able to keep their conditions. And we, we help with marketing, but the, the help is predominantly in giving them access to our collaterals, access to our clinical trial data, and the marketing responsibilities is there. So basically, it's a straight purchase transaction. Um, 
and we're quite comfortable that we can hold our gross margins um, above 75% within that environment still. And then uh, another question you talked about, you know, getting back into the VA uh, hospitals, is that, you know, something that, you know, sales dropped off, uh, you know, due to COVID restrictions? And is it is it, is it just a case of pounding pavements and knocking on doors and reminding people, you know, you're still here, the product is still here and, you know, you need to get back on to uh, order cycles that are in place uh, historically? Um, in the Blastex portfolio, we were heavily in the VA in 2018, and then 3M made us an offer to take the product as the distributor, and to be honest, we were kind of seduced by the very big brand name. So we gave up the distributorship to 3M, and then COVID hit, and at the same time, they bought KCI, Um and KCI is a company with some great technologies, but the more next science technologies you use, the less KCI technologies you need. So we weren't exactly a marriage made in heaven. So we brought it back to next science. Um, we cut the contract early by a year, and we then had to go back to all of our VA customers and bring them back to next science because everything in the hospital was pointing to 3M as their supply chain. So that was something we did as really a 12 month push. And I'm pleased to say they're all back and doing well and, and pleased to see us. And, you know, the product continues to go from strength to strength. And then in terms of regulatory approvals, um, I know you're, it, it, you know, the focus now is expanding outside the US and Australia, New Zealand uh, is the initial focus. But in terms of if we look at at Europe, has it has the bulk of the product portfolio got C mark uh, approval, or is that something uh, that's going to be in train in the background while New Zealand and Australia is, is ramping up? So we have product on sale in Europe through Zimmer. Right, back to shore has a European approval, and Blastex also has a CE mark. Experience will get submitted for CE towards the end of this year. But as probably many of the listeners know, Europe changed in the middle of last year to a new regulatory structure. And that's new for everybody. So those new rules mean that all of your products have to get re-registered. So we're kind of in dual process where we're re-registering back to shore on Blastex and trying a new registration for experience as well. Um, I don't imagine we're going to come through that process because seeing every medical device in the world has to re-register in Europe, the pathways are pretty crowded. Looks worse than Heathrow on a bad day, really. So probably towards the end of next year, you'll see those updated CE marks, but we are cleared to sell Blast, um, yeah, Blastex and back to shore in Europe right now. Okay, great. And then I know the, the partnership with um, 3M didn't work out uh, probably as planned, but uh, you, know, you said on some products, you, you've got your own in-house uh, sales team. Um, is that, a consequence of for certain products you want to have it in-house or is it a consequence of you know there isn't a good fit with a distributor 3m or otherwise uh, at the time being but the preference normally would be to have a distributor model we think that the united states is a market that responds better to direct representation and that means you need to make the economics work. And up until now, it's been kind of, hmm. but we actually believe now that we've unlocked the formula to be able to do that. So we will continue to build out the direct sales in Australia. The decision by the board and management is that only sorry, I meant the United States, only the US will have a direct sales force and that we will use dedicated distributors in the other markets. So we're concentrating on the US market commercially 
and happy to find good people with experience to represent our products in the local markets outside of the US. And does the gross margin then vary significantly, whether you're on the distributor model or the own Salesforce model, or are they kind of much of a muchness once you take in the cost base of having a direct sales team? Uh, the net position is pretty close, yeah, between A and B. And um, obviously on direct sales, our gross margins are higher, but we carry an sg &A line, right, when we do that. Whereas when you're a distributor, when you're just distributing products, you're not carrying any sg &A. And then it, across the product portfolio, that 70 odd percent uh, gross margin that you referenced, is that also pretty standard across all of those product lines? Or is there, you know, one or two um, outliers maybe? No, we're quite lucky, uh, Mark, in that the products are relatively inexpensive to make for a medical device. And, you know, we're, I think by the time we finish the first half, we'll probably have gotten gross margins back at about 80% across the whole portfolio. A lot of hard work by my operations team, just making sure in the post-COVID world, we can get our hands on everything we need. But to be fair, if you don't have 80% gross margins in medical devices, it makes it really hard to do the right investments that you need to support your products by way of clinical research, right? So, you know, you still, your expenses, yes, your sg &A is there, but you're also going to run an expense line in clinical evidence. And um, that can run up some pretty big numbers as well. And just on that clinical evidence, if we're if we're looking forward uh, over this now next six months, I think you referenced it uh, just briefly in the presentation. There's one or two uh, important studies I think that are going to come out. Um, have you got a rough idea and timing and and kind of what the kind of key takeaways people should be should be looking out for when that announcement when those announcements come out? There's three that we'll see this quarter. The first one is a community hospital that's mm -hmm. done over 900 patients across all types of orthopedic procedures. So trauma procedures, hand and foot procedures, as well as hip and knee replacements and shoulder replacements. And they're thrilled with their results because as a community hospital, you don't get to pick and choose your patients. You have to operate on everybody who comes through the door. That's not true of all institutions in the United States. They're, some of them are quite good at selecting patients um, who are lean, mean, and thin and give them very little trouble on the operating table. So that, that study should be out just as we come into the end of August. Then at the same time, there's one done in hip and knee only in an ambulatory surgery centre because that's a different environment for surgery. It's not a tertiary hospital. You're in and out in a day. You know, people are not staying overnight in the hospital to have their surgery. Um, obviously, ensuring you don't send infection home with this patient is key because many of those hospitals are actually and the ambulatory surgery centers are owned by doctors and they want to know that this patient isn't coming back to them because if you get a if you get an infection within the first 90 days of surgery nobody covers the cost the cost is the responsibility of the institution that did the surgery so that data i think will be well received to give people in the ambulatory surgery environment the comfort to know that they are making the right investment because this is i mean the product sells for about 150 dollars us um the competitive products are at least half that price and saline is even less than that so you're asking them to replace easily physically something that they do by standard but there is a, a small increment to the cost so we we very keen to prove to people that we're delivering benefit then one of the really interesting studies that's going to come out is actually being done in a laboratory at the University of New South Wales. And that study is about 
how using our technology as opposed to saline is going to give you better mating of the implant and the bone cement and the bone. Um, I don't know that many people know that quite often when people put hips or knees in you, they're adding actually bone cement in there. <laughs> Might be a good thing really to put in the headline. Um, but it is part of the standard procedure. And one of the failure methods, particularly in knees, is actually that they get something called aseptic loosening. So the implant starts to move in the bone. And so the cement and the implant and the bone are all separating. We think we do a better job connecting the cement to the bone. We know why, we know how. And so we're finishing off some animal studies and some bench work testing at the University of New South Wales that is going to capture a lot of attention because this is a problem, right? And if you can give people some help with existing problems that get in their road today, they have every reason to pick up your product. Judith, we're just up on time and uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us. I know it's late in the day there in uh, Florida. So thank you very much for making the time uh, to join us and present it. And it sounds like there's going to be a lot of uh, between clinical trial stuff and, and sales updates on future uh, appendix forces coming over the next six months. Uh, we'll, there's definitely a lot for uh, people to keep an eye out for. Thank you very much, Mark, and really appreciate the invitation. I hope everybody has a great Friday. Yes, thanks, Judith. Uh, and I do know we have the team from Atomo standing by. Uh, John or Will, uh, if you want to share your screen, uh, that would be great. We'll do that now. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, John. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear us? Uh, yeah, you're coming through. Both of you are coming through loud and clear. Very okay. good. And can you see that, Mark? Uh, I can indeed, Will. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk. Uh, by way of an introduction for anyone who's not, you know, involved with or or across the the, the company, we're a, an Australian headquartered medical device diagnostics company that has developed and commercialised the world's first. Uh, fully integrated blood test devices and those devices replace the need for a, a chemistry set kit uh, and in integrating a, a consumer friendly version of the technology to market we've improved workflow uh, improved the, the look and feel of of consumer testing and also reduced errors and complexity associated with that it has benefits in terms of how users interact with the product and what they think of the product, but more importantly, it delivers better repeatability across users, particularly self-test users, and that leads to, to less errors and more precision, and that uh, gives regulators comfort that those devices are, are very appropriate for home use, and we have a number of self-test approvals that support that, and that's an increasingly important part of the market now, particularly post-pandemic, given that the world has transitioned from doctor office and, and hospital based diagnostics increasingly into home based diagnostics. That's where a lot of the opportunities lie in the diagnostics market and our technology is very well positioned to, to be a market leader in that in that space. So just um, coming to the quarterly then, Mark and, and everyone on the call, um, I guess you'll note that we've moved our cash receipts and our revenue to the top of our highlights. And that's because they've been very, very strong elements of the company's performance in the last quarter and indeed for the year to, to 30 June. So uh, cash receipts from customers for Q4 were 1.9 million, which is an increase of over 170% when compared with Q4 uh, FY 2021. Uh, and cash receipts for the year from customers of over $16 million. Uh, more than 100% growth year on year compared with FY21 of $8 million. So that's been instrumental in funding the business throughout this year and setting us up um, in, in what is obviously a difficult capital market environment to be fully funded uh, into FY23 and beyond. So that's a very pleasing way to finish the year. From a revenue perspective, Similar, similar sorts of numbers, 1.3 million in revenue in Q4, um, which compared with Q4 FY21 is an 89% increase. 
and then revenue for the year has more than doubled, and that's revenue from customers, has more than doubled to uh, just on 14 million for FY22, which is um, compared with 6.7 in, in FY21. So obviously when we put out our annual results, we'll have some more to say about the full year, um, the, the full year PL and balance sheet positions, but very, very pleasing, uh, a very, very pleasing way to finish the year. And I think to reiterate, you know, what we've done, we have responded to changes in the market. Um, the things that we can control, we've controlled, and that's on the costs and expenses side. Um, on the, you know, on the revenue and on the income side, we've had to go where the market is, and that has meant um, uh, accessing, registering, and selling COVID tests. And so of that full year revenue, uh, $14 million, you know, more than $10 million of that came from COVID. And obviously in Australia, that, that peaked uh, in Q3 um, with the very substantial third quarter that we had. Um, but we've seen that continue into the four, fourth quarter, albeit at more moderate levels. And we're also seeing a, you know, something of a pickup in COVID again now as the next wave um, comes through. In terms of the money that we've spent during the quarter and, and during the year, we have done what we said we were going to do, which is um, taper off our CapEx program. We have finished building our production capacity um, for cassettes and we've finished building our second blister machine so that we're now in a position to produce um, you know, many, many millions of both, uh, of all of our existing platforms. And we have um, begun the process of putting in place the tooling and the necessary um, production capacity for our next device, which is the swab device. And John will talk a little bit more about that. So we have pilot production capacity for that, um, full production capacity for uh, our other three platforms, you know, Galileo, Pascal, and and Elion, and the blister that goes inside of those, you know, those those third, uh, second and third platforms. Um, so we've tapered off the capex, and we've increased our investment in market facing activities, business development, um, you know, direct spend, and also indirect spend. So hiring key people in the US and and recently in the UK for the UK, European, and, and African markets. Uh, and we've really been ramping up our activities and hopefully shareholders and others have seen some of that through some of our marketing communications. And John will talk some more about responses we're getting to that, um, particularly in North America, um, you know, over recent months, as all those potential customers and counterparties move, move beyond COVID. So we've, re we've reduced our CapEx, we've increased our spend on, on in-house resources related to business development and marketing. And we've also reduced our exposure to external consulting costs as that work with, you know, has concluded from those external consultants and as we've brought those key resources um, in-house. So our net OPEX and, and net cash flow related to operating activities, um, net net is, is similar going into FY23 as it was in FY22 um, now that we've got that capacity internalised. So we finished the quarter um, with the, just on $13 million in cash. And to reiterate again, no debt. Um, if you look at the, the, the quarterly operating burn, um, that includes payment for a substantial chunk of, of COVID stock, some of which we had on hand at the end of the year. So that's not reflective of an average quarterly. Um, that's really just the, the timing. Um, and when compared with Q3, where we had substantial positive operating cash, you can see that's a timing issue just smoothing itself out over the half. So we'll talk some more about that when we put the full year results out in terms of where that leaves us. So really, they're the key financial highlights. Um, to close on the highlights and then hand to John to talk in a little bit more detail, um, you know, we've sold more than a million units uh, of COVID rapid antigen tests throughout the year and that was a huge effort from the team here, not only to make sure we had all the regulatory um, approvals and things in place, but also to make sure we could onboard new customers quickly and deliver into what was a pretty urgent need at the time. So very pleased with that. Um, we've sold more than half a million HIV tests across the year. And uh, Q4 was stronger than Q3 as things stepped up in that area as well. And there's been a big push into increasing awareness and marketing in the Australian market. Uh, and as I say, you know, commercial activity generally, generally in terms of market facing activities, both here and internationally have ramped up and have been, you know, have been um, resourced additionally throughout the, the quarter and throughout the year. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Well, uh, in terms of, of the... The, the outlook for rapid antigen testing, we are, as we'll mention, continuing to see demand for our professional tests with customers that have been using that product now for, for a year. Uh, that demand obviously less than the peak uh, of Omicron earlier in the calendar year, but still robust and, and continuing. And with the uptick in infections, we expect to see sales of, of COVID product 
continue for 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 the next quarter potentially beyond uh we're also uh sourcing in the short term uh a cell test covid product so we can offer our customers some flexibility in the products that they can purchase and use uh we have continued in parallel with that to support engagement with tga we submitted to them the clinical reports requested for both omicron and delta we're happy with the the, the performance that we that we saw there and we're now waiting for for uh, a decision we believe from from tga on that product but we do have as i mentioned access to to an alternate lower cost product uh, in the short term so we're able to satisfy both professional and self-test market opportunities in fy23 as 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 they uh, arrive we are also as we'll mention seeing some progress with our hiv business changes this year to TGA guidance on advertising, the open, opening up of the pharmacy channel has allowed us to really expand our direct market engagement here. We're seeing a fairly substantial rise in Australian sales, and that's encouraging because that comes at a, at a very good margin for us, given our low cost of goods for, for, for global health. Uh, we are seeing in global health continued progress. Our partner Beatrice continues to register uh, new countries. And we're expecting to see uh, a fairly significant increase in HIV business over the coming 12 months. And we expect HIV volumes and revenues for FY23 to be significantly uh, above what we've delivered for FY22. So that's that's very encouraging. But I think, I think for us, the opportunity over the longer term sits beyond HIV and obviously beyond COVID. Uh, we have been unable for the last two years really to grow the OEM business in part because the, the market was almost exclusively focused on COVID, which is not a blood test, it's a swab test. And we've taken some measures to be more relevant in the swab market longer term. I'll talk about that later in the presentation. But with regard to market engagement, particularly in the US, we've been hamstrung by our inability to travel up until Christmas this year. Uh, and also by the fact that nearly every partner we had in the pipeline or wanted to reach out in the pipeline was, was exclusively focused on COVID. That's now changed. The market more broadly and our partners specifically are very focused on what their business looks like post-COVID. And there's now a resurgence in new product development, particularly for applications that have any kind of app, uh, applicability in, in home or decentralized settings. And that's very encouraging for us because that's exactly where our technology has been positioned. And we find ourselves now in a market that has transformed quite significantly over the last two years. And it's transformed to the benefit of Atomo because we now have a home test segment that's gone from being niche to being high growth. Uh, has gone from being consumer pays only to now being part of the public health system in terms of reimbursement, clinical validation by way of telehealth consults, and also has significant amounts of capital coming into it. And I think we've seen, you know, with the recent acquisition that that, that has been made uh, by, by large e-commerce groups trying to get into the healthcare space, we're really now seeing that the home and, and telehealth is the next frontier for the delivery of healthcare, and that requires products and services that are optimized for consumer use. And that's where Tomo has spent the last 10 years really developing a, a solution, a range of solutions that we think are best in class. And, and that, that utility has been increasingly recognized. As Will mentioned, we brought on a number of uh, experienced commercial development resources and they're currently at the moment in the US at AACC, the American uh, Association of Clinical Chemistry. That's the world's largest diagnostics conference and we have a booth there uh, and we are essentially presenting our technologies to, to many companies for the first time in the US. The feedback from the team has been extremely encouraging. Both our blood test applications as well as our new integrated swab device have been extremely well received by companies both large and small. And I think for us now, the priority is to, to, to evaluate that funnel of opportunity and to deliver a number of short-term OEM contracts and longer-term strategic partnerships that allow us to utilize the 
the scale and leverage of other companies to, to see our technology entered into the market, particularly in the US and Europe, at a scale that we've just been to date unable to deliver. And I think that's a very exciting place to be for us uh, and for share shareholders over the long <coughs> period, because we now have a platform that's increasingly valuable to larger players who want to access home test business. Uh, and I think the COVID pandemic has has a lot to, to play in terms of that transition, because now nearly everyone in the world has done a home test uh, that and, and two or three years ago, that, that certainly wasn't the case. So thing, things are, are, are exciting in the US and we hope to be able to uh, bring to market uh, a number of deliverables that start to validate that. We have uh, scale, as Will mentioned, our CapEx is essentially now complete. We can manufacture it at volume. We've proven we can do that at low cost. We've proven that we can get regulatory approvals for high class applications, both professional use and self-test. Uh, we've proven that we can win the hard to enter markets and win customers and win contracts. And that's really the, the, the blueprint for success. And now it's a case of finding the right product mix and right partners to really scale that up. So we're very excited about the commercial opportunities. We also have invested over the last 12 months in the uh, development of a swab device. We have unique skills, we believe, in terms of the integration of rapid test functionality down into a consumer-friendly package at low cost. We, we've done that very successfully for blood. We were in a slightly uncomfortable position of watching the market uh, focus almost exclusively on swab testing for a period of time. As Will mentioned, we pivoted into that and were able to generate solid revenue growth through the reselling of a partner's test. But really, we felt that to be relevant for the long for the long haul we needed to expand our portfolio to include swab testing we've developed a device that that, that works very well we're pleased to report that the initial internal clinical evaluation of that performance has has established what we hoped and that is that the device significantly improves signal strength for swab based samples being delivered to a cassette and that means that we have expectations of improved sensitivity as well as improved limits of detection for assays and that uh, opportunity to deliver that performance improvement to the market as well as a easier to use simplified workflow we think is very valuable and the interest from ACC uh, tangible and we're now in the process of looking to close out some evaluation agreements with some of the larger companies to look at validating that device with their with their existing tests and then obviously bringing that to market as a, as a, as a high value accessory that they can then access through supply arrangements. It also gives us the opportunity to look to now develop our own finished tests for swab uh, applications and sexual health is certainly one that we're very excited about. Uh, we've had discussions over the last month. I've been in the US and Europe talking to some of the leading e-commerce players who are now starting to gain significant market share at the expense of retail and doctor office healthcare providers. And, and those companies are interested in converting their existing home collection lab test business into an actual home test business, at least for high volume applications and sexual health, certainly one of the ones that they're very focused on. And now having a, a swab device that really adds performance enhancements to swab testing, things like chlamydia and gonorrhea are a lot more feasible for us to now consider. So we're very excited about the product pipeline that we can deliver in conjunction with partners, both supply chain partners, as well as channel partners for sales. And I think the next, the next six months should start to uh, allow us to validate that, that opportunity through the execution of a number of agreements that, that then start to underpin delivery. Uh, just wanted to conclude by saying, you know, at the end of this year, our financial, financial position is strong. Uh, we have cash on hand to deliver the business plan through to 2024 uh, calendar year. No need to raise capital unless we see a strategic opportunity to do so. So we're not, we're not uh, in a position where we have to forego opportunity to conserve cash. We think we can, we can deliver scale with the balance sheet that we've got. And we're very excited about the opportunities moving forward. And we'll be able to obviously expand more at our year-end report on 
how we delivered over the year, but more importantly, where we think we're going to be able to take the business over the coming uh, 12 to 24 months. In terms of sort of highlights for this coming period over the next six to 12 months, we obviously want to you know, look at completing those product development and product commercialization partnership engagements in the US and Europe, and to then agree with partners a, a short list of products that we will then deliver to market. And we expect the first of those decisions to be getting made quite, quite soon. Uh, we'll be looking to expand our OEM customer base. We've had a, an overwhelming response to the technology and, and the solutions that we can offer at AACC. I'm confident we can turn that into a, a robust pipeline of, of agreements. And really, it's just a case of us trying to resource and deliver on, on opportunities now over the next 12 to 24 months. We will continue to look to expand our HIV sales. We're looking to now enter into the professional use market. We've appointed somebody in the UK that's an expert in building and managing distributor networks, and she will be looking to take our HIV business and, and do just that, as well as adding new products into that channel as we bring them to market. Uh, COVID, we continue to maximize the opportunity and, and revenues from COVID as we, as we can, but we, we, we were never... An, a COVID business. We were a medical device business that, that, that used COVID to generate revenue. The main story for us is becoming the market leader in the provision of best-in-class testing devices to market. And those devices span blood, saliva, and hopefully, sorry, uh, swab, and hopefully soon saliva applications. And that's where we can add the most value to, to market and, and to shareholders. Um, that's really our summary for the quarter. Happy to, to take any questions that might have come in. Uh, thanks, John. Thanks, Will. Um, one, uh, two that have uh, emailed in ahead of time, uh, and I know you have kind of touched on it, um, both these questions in your remarks, but we might just uh, delve a little deeper. Um, one was uh, uh, about a recent study that showed, um, you know, people prefer the... the the, the swab testing to the blood testing I'm guessing they probably think it's a maybe a little less invasive or maybe a little less revealing um is that also part of the thinking of why you're going down uh you know the swab testing uh functionality in in addition to the I guess the the historical base that was built in the, in the HIV blood self testing yeah, that's a good question. So there's a couple of answers to that. Uh, I think the first one is that, that that user preference was not overwhelming. It was six out of 10 preferring uh, a, a sort of saliva-based swab test to blood. That means four out of 10 still preferred the Atomo device. And I think that reflects the fact that blood is a better clinical sample than saliva for a lot of tests, which is why it provides better diagnostic performance. So there is a a perception of saliva being less invasive and and that's that's true but it's not overwhelmingly true a lot of people still recognize that that a blood sample provides typically better performance uh, so it depends on the application as to how feasible saliva is for some applications the clinical performance just isn't good enough on saliva but certainly saliva is less invasive, we recognize that, and we work really hard to deliver an Atomo level of usability to swab testing, and that device is now being commercialized, and we're very excited about the opportunities, and that gives us the ability to offer the market both saliva and blood applications, and, you know, we have been a blood test company, we're not exclusively blood uh, focus, we're happy to expand into swab testing. It opens up the addressable market for us and gives our customers, you know, a range of solutions that we can deliver for them. And then the, the second question, uh, again, you kind of touched on in, the, in your remarks, is the uh, approval from TGA for the, the rapid antigen uh, test that you guys have developed your own proprietary one and, and the delays in that coming through you know, when there are other, I guess, rapid antigen tests which have already been approved, is it more a case of the ones that have been approved were, you know, existing tests or, you know, ones that had got 
approval from other regulators and other markets already and were you know were, were in use and there was a lot of um i won't say a lot but there was clinical data trial data real world data that you know could be submitted with their applications whereas for your device uh you know it was something that was uh built uh in response to uh, a need uh, and you know hadn't been already up and running in the US or the UK or or Japan or anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, well, for, firstly, we we provided recently to TGA the clinical studies that they requested for Omicron and Delta. So we we at the moment don't have any further data to provide. We're happy with the data that we have provided. That data was requested based on a change of requirements by TGA. So prior to our submission, uh, limited detection studies were not being required for approval. Uh, and we, in fact, saw the same test that we have submitted uh, approved by a different sponsor under a different brand in Australia. So that test, the test that we've submitted to TGA has already been approved as a self-test in another format prior to the TGA then uh, asking for additional limited detection studies to be provided for subsequent products that wanted to get approval. Those limited detection studies have been extremely difficult to get done because they require uh, live samples uh, as part of the protocol, and that is for variants as they appear. So firstly, Delta, then Omicron. So that's taken time to organize. We've had to go offshore to get some of those studies done. Those studies were completed and submitted in the last number of weeks to TGA. So that's been a slow process and, and that's been frustrating, but that's what we've had to do to, to meet the requirements. And we have uh, now submitted all of that data. Uh, in the meantime, we have to take advantage of the commercial opportunity that we saw in the market, being able to source third-party tests to provide our customers with self-test solutions as part of our overall offering. But really our focus has been on professional use testing and that is in large part because the professional testing market has provided better pricing. Self-testing has been extremely commoditized in Australia since the government started buying cheap tests overseas and putting them onto the market. And the pricing for self-test antigen testing in Australia is now at, at a low cost commodity price, which makes the long-term outlook for self-testing not that attractive. And we've been focusing on better margin business and professional use where we support customers who appreciate our, our quality, our service, and the quick turnaround time of our test. Yeah, I just want to touch on, John, the, you know, the, I guess, you know, the 10 million of sales that uh, we'll reference the, in terms of uh, COVID tests um, that you have been managed to sell and all the kind of, I guess, you know, a business that maybe nearly started from scratch uh, and to get to 10 million in sales. Can a lot of those learnings in terms of, customer onboarding, you know, supply chain um, processes, procedures. Can a lot of that, you know, be transferred now over to the ramp up that you're expecting in the HIV business over the next 12 to 24 months as, you know, these direct sales people in the UK and the US, you know, start uh, hitting their straps? Do, do you think that a lot of that a lot of our school fees can be carried over into the HIV business to, you know, to accelerate it and not have some of the stumbling blocks that, um, you know, you might have uncovered uh, through the COVID rollout. Yeah, no, it's a good point, Mark. I think the, <clears throat> the infrastructure we have in place now in terms of people and production capacity sets us up to be able to deliver whatever we need to deliver. We're not constrained by our resourcing internally and we're not constrained by our production capacity. So we have over the, the past couple of years, and in particular as a result of you know, the, the, the growth in customer base, particularly in Australia, but, but generally we've really um, refined our systems. And so we're operating very efficiently at this end. We also have um, you know, sales, marketing and business development people now in Australia and overseas, and they are operating across whatever products that, that we have to sell. So that, that means, you know, one of the really great things about the Atomo business model, to, to bring it right back to basics, is that we produce platforms and those platforms have different applications. So we can leverage that installed capacity for lots of different markets. And that's still the main aim of the business is to broaden our portfolio 
across global health for high volume and, and obviously lower margin and across developed markets for um, you know, slightly lower volumes but much higher margin products so that the overall portfolio of the business is really strong. And we can support that with the people, the team, the corporate structure, the systems and so on that we have installed and COVID helped us to accelerate that and help us to pay for that. So that puts us in a really great position to actually leverage through to profitability. And that, you know, that is the strategy with the business. We can continue to operate with, you know, the overhead that we have right now, but do sales double, triple and so on with that kind of installed capacity of people in production. Okay, great. Uh, Will, John, we are literally just up on time. It's actually perfect timing. Uh, thank you very much for coming back in this morning and giving us uh, an update on all things Atomo. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, if you stop sharing your screen, thank you. Uh, and uh, if we could hand over now to uh, Jay Albany from Wide Open Agriculture. Jay, if you want to start sharing your screen. I will let you know when I can see the, the cover slide. Lovely. All right, thanks. thanks. Bye. Thanks, All right, thank you. thanks, Sean. Thanks, Will. Uh, it's just coming through now. Yeah, I can see the cover slide of your presentation now, Jay. Okay, wonderful. Um, so can you can you hear me okay? Am I yeah, all good to start? Uh, uh, audio is also perfect. Wonderful. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for letting me uh, participate in this, uh, Mark. I uh, just wanted to uh, provide a little update on the company. I'm pleased to let you know we had uh, one of our um, best quarters uh, probably in the existence of the company uh, that ended in June. Um, for a little bit uh, of background, uh, my name is Jay Albany. I'm CEO of Dirty Clean Food, which is the commercial arm of Wide Open Agriculture. It's a regenerative food and agriculture business uh, founded by Ben Cole and Anthony Maslin. Um, the ticker is WOA. The company's corporate name is Wide Open Agriculture. Um, so this business uh, is really about how to recreate a new way to interact with food and farming uh, using regenerative farming techniques and regenerative practices to create uh, a channel for consumers to access um, product they can feel good about directly through farmers uh, in a new way. Um, and so the company has a four returns uh, framework, uh, social, um, financial, sorry, getting a sip of my coffee. So uh, the four returns framework founded with Common Land um, uh, Foundation. So it's a it's a pretty exciting thing, social, financial, environmental, and inspirational. And I'm going to talk about the results because that's why I'm here. Um, as soon as I get this to advance, ah, there we go. So um, really big quarter for us. Um, you know the 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 way our company reports uh, results is. We, we have an ongoing food brand, Dirty Clean Food, which sells a variety of regenerative products across three channels. Uh, direct to consumer here in Perth. Um, we also work with a growing, uh, a quickly growing number of retailers. So we have a, a retail grocery store uh, product line. Uh, we also service many of the top restaurants uh, in Western Australia um, with our regenerative produce. And what's special about our food is a combination of the environmental impact of regenerative farming, uh, as well as uh, you can taste the difference. Uh, we're in many of the top restaurants in town with our products. Uh, we're in a growing number of high-end uh, grocery stores and uh, cafes. So um, it is definitely this combination of, we make food like, um, like you imagine your parents had growing up, you know, in this natural way before, um, for the way um, for this sort of surge of industrial um, food production. Uh, and the biggest kind of initiative that we've invested in over the last, um, really a huge change over the last year, but this has been a two year project is, uh, you know, a, a lupin based plant protein product. Uh, we've trademarked it Bunteen Protein. Um, and so, just to give you some context, when, when Ben and Maz founded the company, their kind of vision was, let's create this really unique four returns company that 
um, creates value in a new way to think about and improve um, farming systems and and um, jobs in the wheat belt. And um, so there's a there's a whole story of business of the business before we launched Dirty Clean Food that's really focused on that. Um, and Dirty Clean Food is is the distribution um, and sort of selling channel through which we can um, monetize these products. But um, the loop and protein products uh, in our oat milk are really um, actualizing that vision of let's take things that grow spectacularly in the wheat belt. Let's partner with regenerative farmers. Let's encourage regenerative farming and let's command a, a premium in the market. Um, for farming the right way that benefits uh, the company, uh, shareholders, um, and our financial returns. So um, Lupin is really, oat milk and Lupin are sort of these two large initiatives for us, uh, and they're both doing fabulously well. Um, Lupin, uh, we partnered, we licensed a technology from Curtin University. We've got a, a global exclusive license to that technology. Um, and when we licensed it a, a couple of years ago, um, it was very small scale. This, you know, we're talking tens of grams of performance, uh, not human grade, um, uh, not for, for eating. Uh, so it's been a, a journey um, to take that into something that could be a, a food product. Uh, and this quarter was uh, massive for us because over the last couple of years, you know, we, we advanced that technology from, you know, tiny amounts of grams to food safe to can you do it something in a kilogram style to can you do a couple you know 10 kilograms and um our sort of plan heading into the year into this fiscal year this was our fourth quarter was let's advance this a little bit further let's let's get some uh research and development tech you know um infrastructure you know make a little bit maybe there'll be enough to use in a dirty clean food product um but what we found was that Last year, sort of the end of the calendar year, 22, uh, we were we were testing um, this this product in a you know in a prototype phase in our oat milk, uh, and we found that uh, the product was a lot further along um, commercially than than you know with commercial potential than we thought. So this this whole project is ahead of schedule, um, and then um, obviously we put out a press release saying, hey, we're going to put out um, you know, a, a high protein oat milk uh, under dirty clean food. And, and of course, started doing the uh, rigorous process of, you know, it's a long sales cycle in ingredient food sales, uh, but started quickly uh, following up with um, large global companies. And so this quarter, um, so then we had a capital raise last year to accelerate our move into um, plant-based foods. This was um, to, to expand the scope of uh, what we could do with the Lupin pilot facility uh, to accelerate our oat milk uh, business so that our manufacturing facility has um, higher returns and is de-risked as soon as it comes online. And um, so it's been kind of an exciting period here. And this last quarter, I think if you could take anything from it, um, during the quarter, during the quarter, we announced um, a deal with Bondi Nissen, uh, a, a massive, um, a massive global food company, um, and they have an Australian subsidiary here. Uh, you know, they make things that you've heard of: um, uh, black swan dips, uh, the packaged crackers. Uh, but probably important to um, what we're talking about is that you know this their parent company is the owner of Corn, um, uh, a mycoprotein company, and they've they have a history of investing in this space. So for us, this was a really huge opportunity. And um, we announced that in in May. This is um, very exciting. Why they why we had that announcement uh, or why they chose to work with us is really, um, you know, they're committed to sustainability. Uh, the the regenerative story of dirty clean food is something that does resonate uh, for those of us who followed wide open agriculture a long time. Um, I think when we were first talking about regenerative food, it was very niche, and there's a lot of people who um, kind of understood that it was eco-friendly, but didn't um, didn't really get it. And then there was a group of very passionate, dealt, you know, people who got it strongly. Um, but it was a small group. Now, I think over the last two years, what we're finding is that um, the larger food companies who are our potential partners uh, in supply as we expand beyond Australia are very much understand what regenerative farming is, and they're looking for ways to increase their um, 
to, uh, for lack of a better word, clean their ingredient list um, and um, and partner with uh, a company like us is actually pretty attractive, even though we're relatively small compared to some of these companies. The, the authenticity of what we've been doing here and and obviously the product quality uh, is something that makes us an attractive partner. So um, we announced uh, in May in this quarter that we had this agreement far ahead of, I think, anyone's expectations. Um, and we uh, commissioned the pilot plant. Um, oh, I'll just say, uh, I think the reason I'm talking about Lupin is because I feel like this is the really big um, driver of the company. But I do want to say that, um, you know, not lost is that we've built a super high growth, uh, really game changing uh, regenerative food brand here in uh, Perth that's starting to expand globally. So 12 consecutive quarters of growth in dirty clean food. Um, as you can see, looking quarter by quarter, um, you know, there there is are big jumps and we have a new big initiative and, and digesting periods, but 12 in a row, um, really proud that we grew this quarter when so much of the attention of the company was rightfully on making sure we executed uh, our Lupin pilot project. Um, Dr. Ben Cole is our managing director. Um, yeah, I think he's just reiterating here what I said in this quote, uh, but, uh, you know, what I would like to uh, sort of reiterate is that, hey, this is our first supply agreement, um, and this is the beginning of a massive market here uh, for the company, and it's a product, Lupin, that is unique to Western Australia. Not that it can't grow anywhere else, but 60% of the world's Australian sweet Lupin grown right here uh, in this state, the majority of it in the wheat belt, the exact place uh, that Ben and Maz targeted um, you know, when they launched the company as a place they want to affect. So we are a company that gets things done. Uh, we are a company that has a bold vision and we're passionate and committed to actually getting things done. Um, just some context for how Dirty Clean Food and our overall company has grown. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, you know, over 100% growth this year. Uh, big change really is what I was alluding to earlier, global partners, uh, global potential partners, um, we are starting to get on their radar screen. And as the first product that we're sort of taking uh, globally is oat milk, uh, which is now sold in um, is now sold in three countries, three geography re geographic regions. But we have uh, agreements in place for up to five um, that we've announced that will be rolling out in the next couple of quarters. Um, and, and these and then lupin lupin uh, protein, which we're calling bunting protein, is is really a product that has global implications. Um, so, uh, what actually happened this quarter? Why am I so um, pumped about it? Uh, well, we built a pilot facility um, you know, quickly uh, on time with, and we've added a, a full scale lab like we were originally planning. Um, this is a facility that. Uh, we expand the scope of it so we can continue to do our R&D work. We can continue to engage in new partners, but we can also, and kind of what we found was that having it in a lab, we were kind of past the stage of, uh, in business development terms of send me a few kilos, I'll, I'll analyze the stuff. My technical team will talk to your technical team. Like we we passed that threshold uh, basically faster than, than we thought we would um, for certain applications. Um, Bunting protein works very well in terms of its uh, gelation and its solubility. Um, so what I mean by that is things where um, a, a meat mimic um, or a, an analog to meat where the uh, texture uh, is very important. So a liquid, a dairy alternative, a liquid, uh, a cheese, a yogurt, um, a noodle, uh, a soft noodle that sort of has a little bit of ply to it. Um, these are areas where our product works really well and versus a, uh, competitive plant proteins like soy and um, pea, um, because to get that effect, uh, the other substitutes uh, have to combine um, additional you know, ingredients, uh, many of which are not 100% natural to get that effect. So uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty exciting uh, application. Um, so we just realized we're, we have a good product, not just a good product. We have a really differentiated product right now, if we can make it. So we really focused on how do we get to a point where we can leverage these good conversations? And that's why we expanded the scope of the plant. And that's where um, the majority of our uh, increase in spending, it's just where we said we do it. It's right here uh, in this project. 
Um, so we've expanded this, uh, the Monty Nissen agreement. Um, we announced that in May. We officially opened the pilot plant uh, in June. It was uh, end of June. It was a really big uh, event, something that was kind of a, a milestone um, time for the company. Uh, the, a lot of material was there. Many local state government officials were there. Um, it was it was exciting. Um, and we've commenced production. Um, so um, we started, you know, a few days before, well, we actually started the whole time. We sort of officially started on that day in June with the press release we put out. And, um, you know, we're working with Monday Nissen. Um, they've received product, um, working with Monday Nissen to um, get the product that, uh, that we that we both want to uh, work for for their needs. They have multiple food products that they are evaluating our product for. There there is one we announced. Um, you know, it's not for me to discuss their um, their schedule, but from our perspective, um, you know this is a really exciting opportunity. So I can't stress that enough. This I couldn't think of a better partner. And it's definitely a top five dreamless partner uh, to work with us on this with an Australian subsidiary. Um, and so things are going great there. Uh, Dirty Clean Foods also going to sneak out some um, some exciting uh, bunting protein enhanced, I guess, uh, products to sort of proof of concepts. Um, one of the things that's uh, interesting about our company um, with the website, uh, I know a lot of the investor focus is on um, you know, the plant-based products because that's the big and attractive market, but um, one of the interesting things about what we can do with Dirty Clean Food is that it's big enough. Um, it's big enough that we that we can make products that are are properly made. And we can afford to have a little bit of a product development team, um, but it's um, small enough that we can be nimble and innovative. So a lot of our um, a lot of our pipeline and a lot of our business development in these plant based spaces can be um, accelerated by launching a Dirty Clean Food product. Uh, with showing off the functionality and taste. Here's what it could be. Um, look, people are buying it um, as we go along. So you should think of Dirty Clean Food as, as a really exciting food brand that is participating in a global shift towards more sustainability. Where does your food come from? Convenience of shopping. But you should also think of it as this is a little bit of an incubation center that a company in the world's most geographically isolated city can... Um, and cook up some interesting things and then go show that they work, show that this uh, concept works uh, with consumers in the world's best test market, uh, and then approach uh, larger companies and other geographies for um, business development. Um, I will talk briefly about our oat milk. Um, the, the oat milk uh, business uh, also has done uh, extremely well. Uh, we launched this product uh, beginning of 2021. Uh, commercially, uh, we experienced all of the um, you know, challenges that everyone else in the industry did uh, in terms of you know shipping times, shipping costs, uh, complex uh, problems in COVID, um, you know different channels being available. Uh, but Perth was relatively protected, so we were able to sort of build and learn uh, our go-to-market strategy in Perth, um, which. And then once, um, as the company, as the world started to open up, and we had a little more um, ability to do business outside of WA, um, we were able to really strike some exciting deals. Um, one that I'm, I'm super excited. I mean, how many how many companies have you heard? We just launched into Woolworths. Uh, the first product um, was available for sale this quarter that just ended. Which is why I'm talking about this, but. Uh, how many companies do you know that 18 months um, in terms uh, from their product launch uh, of a completely new product for them uh, are in um, 650 Woolworths? Uh, it's, it's, the response is very positive. Um, so we've tried to communicate this with investors. Um, and, and the way that we track it for competitive reasons is, you know, I think it's actually pretty transparent. Every time we um, announce a deal, um, you know, we, 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 in a new country or with a you know substantial enough deal in a local retailer um, we put or distributor we we put out a press release we track the number of locations so uh, the basically the cycle of the deal is um, you know a period of negotiation and testing and winning the business and then um, the period of sort of initial order placement shipment anything custom that needs to be done for that large customer um, 
if it's a new country, there's packaging and regulatory considerations. So a period of preparing and then uh, a shipment out to the customer, and then that customer digests uh, the stock initial for the first order initially until it gets out in the distribution network, and that's when they start to show up on this graph. Uh, hey, it's in these number of Woolworths. Um, and of course, we also disclose um, the deal. We're probably not going to uh, disclose much additional beyond that this time it's a competitive market and we're at a little bit of a disadvantage but uh we're going to keep looking for ways to share how it's going uh with investors in a way that makes it very easy for you to do the math of is this doing well about how much of their business is it um so um big things coming up i see i'm running up on 20 minutes um so i'll just i'll just quickly hit a couple of these dirty clean food things um uh, dirty clean food, uh, oat milk. This is this is our top. This is our top priority. Uh, is this high protein oat milk? It's the fourth uh, bullet point here. Um, uh, basically, what I mean is um, we we have found a way for Lupin um, to work with uh, our oat milk. As as I was mentioning, we test these things, and we saw it was such a good a good blend and it produced a good product last year so we um we've continued to advance this product development so at this point um if you i'm sure if you are going around shopping you can see there's lots of oat milks and ours is amazing because it's made from the best oats in the world and it's regenerative and um you know it's healthier it has a better ingredient list but in general the category is really um crowded and all sort of producing a there's it's bifurcating into like a group of high end products, um, Oatly, us, minor figures, uh, alternative dairy co, uh, and a group of sort of low end, uh, lesser products. And so what we are trying to do, um, uh, over the next few months and leading up to the loss to the launch of our high protein oat milk, um, is create space for us focused on, hey, this is oat milk, how the oats are grown matters. Um, being not dairy is not anything that is unique to anyone on the shelf. What do we do that is special and different? Um, all leading up to um, a launch of a, an oat milk, which is a dairy equivalent protein. So wh why do people drink oat milk? Um, you know, some are lactose intolerant. The majority of people are um, seeking some kind of health or environmental benefit. Um, vitamins can be... Uh, can be uh, added to an oat milk, but um, getting the right protein in a consistency that uh, gelates and has solubility is something that oat milk is, as a category, actually, it's probably the biggest knock on the category in terms of its nutrition. But we think we've sort of cracked a nut and it combines our two biggest, uh, well, really our three biggest initiatives because it's sold on dirty, clean food. So it, it kind of combines everything that the company is doing into one big push. So you'll be looking to see uh, a very big push for this dairy equivalent protein oat milk probably launched uh it's hard to say exactly when but uh, uh definitely not later than um first calendar quarter of 23. so very excited about that um obviously uh we've committed to producing locally uh we're that project is looking pretty good uh i guess i would say that we're going to announce details on that um probably during this quarter so there's not much I can say, we did try to disclose a little bit um, about this uh, in the sense of scoping the facility, 20 million liters. You guys can all go to the store and see what oat milk costs uh, back into how much revenue potential that could be. Um, it, it's uh, This is a big uh, opportunity for us uh, and we've had some really encouraging um, support from um, you know, obviously customers who will commit ahead of time uh, and, and partners and um, encouraging conversations with other local um, groups uh, as well as international groups to make this uh, to sort of de-risk this project. So we're, um, we're very excited about this. We're 100% committed to this as well. Same time, um, I think everyone on this uh, call and anyone who follows well knows that um, the key to our company's success is executing our loop and pilot and translating that into a loop and commercial facility. And so that is where our best people are working. Um, uh, all of our people are best, but that is where we're focusing our sort of top priority as we, as we, um, as we head into the quarter and it's a whole year is let's, let's make sure we execute uh, on our pilot plant. So let's make sure we execute on business development to, to build a book for a commercial plant. 
Um, this is a, a group we just, you know, I think there's been a little bit of a, a little bit of uh, concern, um, or not really concern, but just sort of interest in how are you going to market this? How are you going to separate from oat milks? Um, so I, I guess I just want to give you a little bit of a flavor. We're launching a, um, we're launching a uh, campaign um, now that we have natural distribution um, and we're fully stocked at Woolworths. It's a multi-pronged campaign, some over the top, uh, like which means basically, you know, advertising direct to consumer, like what you're seeing, and some below the line, um, which means sort of in combination with um, our retail partners. Um, this is a, the this is these are all ads that have run, uh, and you'll start to see um, you'll start to see these ads on the East Coast pretty soon, um, and and a whole bunch that I'm not showing you. But um, the uh, interesting thing is, you know, trying to Trying to have a tone of voice that um, has the personality of of the target customer in oat milk, um, but also has the sort of earnesty of a uh, environmental someone who cares about the environment and how to create space for us different from the other oat milks. We are a premium product. We are intentionally priced um, as a premium product, and we want to preserve that. Um, uh yep yeah, uh just quickly here um i'll open it up for questions um just you know this is a slide that we like to just share so you can see the the mix of revenue um and the mix of um who our retail customers are um you know as you can see it's a it's a pretty evenly balanced um it's a pretty evenly balanced uh graph here with with nice growth um and uh, I guess I guess we'll probably be looking at this way that we report this mix at some point because um, distributors who service retail are hard to track because they may serve as a combination of cafes and retail. So we may we may have to um, we may have to uh, look at that particular designation. This is direct to retail, um, I think, uh, and then um, and then obviously digital. So. Uh, just one thing to call your attention to uh, is, uh, you know, if, if you ask how we're doing uh, in our new markets, we've launched Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, and those are two uh, two pretty large uh, grocery partners in those markets. So um, it is happening. We are making progress. This idea of taking the best of Australia that could be farm regeneratively and sharing with the world, it's, it's no longer just a slide. We're doing it. So... Um, I think I'm going to uh, take a break for questions. Uh, I think there's a few minutes left if anyone wants to ask anything. Uh, thanks, Chair. I've uh, I've got uh, one. If we can just follow on on the adding the lupin into the oat milk to make the high protein one, uh, our high protein mm -hmm. version. Is that a strategy then that will require another route to market, channel to market into you know the kind of health supplements type channel for the kind of health and fitness or is it more an idea of we're going to have on the shelf if I walk into a Woolworths uh, in Sydney it's going to have the standard oat milk one and like right beside it you have the alternative of choosing the high protein one if that's kind of more what you're looking for um, I'm just trying to get an understanding of where the high protein one is going to sit in terms of uh, market positioning yeah, that, that's a great question, and I probably should have. Um, so I'll just say quickly, we're going to have a dairy equivalent protein. So dairy milk, uh, like a full cream milk, has about 3 or 4% protein. Um, and that that will be the sort of hero mass-produced wide, all of our channels carry it. Um, and then we're also going to have a high protein sort of for those who, you know, if you're thinking about a convenience channel um, where where you're, um, I mean, you guys know what I'm, you all have, have seen these high protein uh, drinks um, and having a vegan one made with, we made with ingredients for the protein you can feel good about drinking from an environmental and uh, justice perspective. So, um, I, which is, so yes, the answer is there's really two products that'll come out. There'll be uh, an upgrade of our core oat milk line to dairy equivalent protein, um, which we think will be uh, a, a very big uh, advancement uh, in the industry. And there is also going to be a line of sort of closer to a ready to drink sized, um, well, actually it'll be ready to drink, um, 
with flavors uh sort of it'll probably be sold in, in grocery and convenience but um you know with the convenience market in mind um and uh our, we're currently selling a cold brew in a can um so the cold brew in a can is kind of our um, entryway into that convenience market to start building distribution to flow the high protein oat milk uh drinks in there i mean i definitely encourage you to go take a look next time you're refilling your car at how much space is dedicated now to this kind of a um this kind of a product and 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 for sure nutritional uh health stores um will be selling uh to there as well and um you know with this national advertising campaign coming up uh and you know the launch of these new products uh what is the impact or you know what are you thinking around you know high energy prices high transport costs generally like high inflation how are you guys managing or thinking about that in terms of you know a, a, a consumer facing product with uh you know inflation on one side rising costs on the other side uh, and still trying to you know maintain a balance uh in terms of like profitability you know right across the chain for retailers yourselves distributors yeah that's a good question um uh, inflation is is definitely happening um and it's been apparent in our supply chain for a while and i think it's making its way to everyone it's, it's clear from the data um it is something that affects uh, our competitors as well um but um yeah it's challenging to pass along prices uh immediately uh when you receive a cost it kind of depends on the channel um in our digital business, we can pass along price increases relatively quickly, but what you'll find is there's substitution um, for, you know, people start to shop on on um, the dollar price versus the per kilo price or what they want. There, there are limits. Uh, in the food service uh, elements of our business, yeah, there's certainly um, far more established parts of the business, and we, we've totally disrupted the um, food service supply in Perth and WA for um, high-end meat. Uh, so for those ones where you have a big existing base, like, yeah, there's definitely substitution occurring so that they can make money. Um, for oat milk, I think, you know, we're still kind of the scrappy entrant. Um, so it's it's actually a little, I mean, certainly it's something we're concerned about in terms of shipping and, and obviously we're, we're moving as quickly as we can to um produce domestically um oat milk there's, there's not a place to make oat milk in western australia and um we're trying to change that so obviously that is a huge thing for us and that will um for something that costs five dollars in the store and is full of liquid um shipping is a big deal for that um so um that'll that'll give us a lot of um a lot of leeway against uh foreign competition when that's live um but you know i guess i guess what i would say is it is affecting everyone else our understanding from the industry um and our, our customers is that um for a while it was intense trying to hold on and now everyone's putting in price increases uh we we are not likely to increase our price of oat milk uh we we, we had the opportunity to price it accordingly to this market um i mean if things continue in this direction and get much much worse maybe but we we price it at a at a um you know with a good return okay perfect jay we're just up on time actually we've gone slightly over time so i think we will leave it there if anybody's got any further questions uh, feel free to reach out to Jay, his email address is there, or, in, or indeed Ben, who has uh, presented previously to us, I think on two occasions in the past, if I remember correctly. And uh, yeah, we'll keep an eye out for updates on Monday Nissan and, and for the advertising campaign. I'm sure people are going to notice it uh, a bit more now that we've seen a, a sneak peek of the ad. Or one out. Yeah, there. it's all right. Well, um, yeah, keep your eyes peeled. Thanks so much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak.